The death of God is about the drying up of a horizon of meaning and of a whole form of human life. Where do we stand in the illusion it makes? What kind of space are we invited into? The material relations between people become social relations between things. When we look at toasters, corn, and TVs, we don't we see We still, to a large extent, live in the interregnum between, between worlds, if you will, or between paradigms. Not many people in the history of the world have faced that. Inside Critical Theory brings you this Diet Soap interview. So let's, okay, Jason Miles from This Is Revolution and the band Bitter Lake. <laughs> who, oh, has wow. a, who will have a new record coming out. Bitter Lake will have a new record coming out on Thanksgiving. Oh, awesome. That's great. And uh, is it like a single or an album? It's going to whole album. It's not 10 instrumental songs that I use for the little in, video clips that I make. Mm -hmm. um, I, I actually do create songs. So the video clips, you're not even hearing the whole song. You're hearing a portion of it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, earlier on my birthday, I kind of joked that I would release all the songs. People kept saying, oh, you're going to release it. You're going to release it. So I was like, oh, fuck it. Yeah, I'll do it. So I'm going to try to release something every every holiday as a well, gift. To the, uh, you've let me use your music in some of the projects I've yeah. done, some of the little films I've done, and it's great. It's it works really well. Uh, but you know, the way I work with music is I often like just I'll go, I'll take like a catalog of stuff, and I'll just I'll already have the narration, and yeah. I'll just try running different songs underneath, and then I don't know. Usually, I just pick whatever sounds the glitchiest. But anyhow, <laughs> whatever sounds most like an, an Atari that's been on fire. I'm I trying to put together a, a, a sound library for you. My my drummer actually makes more music to that era of glitchy. I I try and I can't do it because I, I need to have a lot of rhythm. No, you do a lot of good mood music, though. And I used it a lot. I think I used a good amount of it in this little short film that set the... It's in the running at Slam Dance. It doesn't. It, it, I've been told that we probably didn't get in because we would have been told already if we had. But who knows? We could still get in. The official deadline is December seventeenth. And if it we don't get in, I've got a little short film about cyberpunk, and uh, it will be going up on the channel. But listen, Jason Miles, you are here to talk about how you were a teenage anarchist, <laughs> and I and I read uh, your essay, and then I thought about this book. Have you seen this book? Have you read this book? You know this book? No, no, I did not. It's Lipstick Traces, A Secret History of the 20th Century by Grail Marcus, and it came but, out. But you know what did inspire me to write that piece was J.T. Leroy. Okay. Yeah, so I don't know J.T. Leroy. <laughs> you remember you know, J.T. Leroy? <laughs> no, no. Who, well, do, do you know Grail Marcus? Have you heard of Grail Marcus? Mm -hmm. Okay, so Grail Marcus was like a music critic. Uh, this book came out in 1989 originally. Um <clears throat> he was a music critic and he wrote for Rolling Stone. He was sort of like the uh, the intellectual music okay. critic for Rolling Stone. And this was a big, fat, thick book about how the situation is international and Dada uh, wow. uh, informed the punk music of the 70s. Um, so that's what, why I thought about it. Go ahead, man. To a degree, I think the first wave of what you get with the Sex Pistols, the way I've kind of positioned that piece is, in my opinion, um, the Sex Pistols give you the aesthetic of punk rock, mohawks, safety pins, anarchy, the, the snotty attitude. Mm -hmm. um, what we think of as punk, I think you get more from the Sex Pistols which is the British version of the American version that had been coming there for a little bit with like the Ramones and, and, and the New York dolls and bands like that. So mm -hmm. I know there's proto quote unquote, proto punk bands and you can throw the MC five in there and, and maybe even bands like the Stooges. I don't start with the American bands. I start with the British bands because in my opinion, it is the British bands that truly inspire that first wave of of 80s hardcore in in uh mostly orange county and and dc is where the bigger bands come from new york i guess yeah so but the situationist influence on uh marshall mclaren 
Yes. Well, Malcolm McLaren. My, Malcolm McLaren. Malcolm McLaren, yeah. Yeah. Um, and the way he put the, the Sex Pistols together, like in the same way that you might put a band together like the Monkees. Um, kind of, yeah. Yeah. You know, he just he picked people out to, to become part of the, the, I, of the band. I, it, it, isn't it interesting? Like when I, so what caught me about the situationist aspect of Malcolm McLaren and why I wanted to put that in there, mm. because as I'm, Figuring this piece out, and it was a lot of long conversations with Toure, who hooked me up with some other actually punk academics guys that literally were part of the 80s hardcore scene. Mm -hmm. And then also living in the studio, I knew guys from the scene. Mm -hmm. If you look at my, uh, what do you call that thing? My iTunes profile, it's me and Ted Falcone watching a football game from Flip. <laughs> So those are like like this this piece is also a bit of a love letter to a, a genre of music that that has helped shape me as a, as a person mm -hmm. and, and people in that genre of music that have done a, a lot for me as a, as a person. But um, when I think about Malcolm McLaren's time in the situationist movement, and you know that's that could be debated about how deep into it he was. That's not the point. To me, the point is that he takes that knowledge. And he does have a bit of a Marxist critique, even to the end of his life. Mm -hmm. Like the first draft I had, I kind of put certain things that he was saying towards the end of his life about fighting capitalism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but when I think about the God Save the Queen on the boat, the Sex Pistols do on the Queen's birthday. Mm hmm you're like, whoa, that's insane. <laughs> that's insane to think these dudes did that. Their song was like a number one or number two hit, and it was just a black bar because they didn't even want to say who the fuck it was. So <laughs> right, the thing right. that McLaren does with the Sex Pistols that can't be duplicated with the first wave of this music that's pretty much a derivative of that is find mainstream success to tap into something that the people the working class people and also they're being bombarded with pop music at the same time in the mm. uk to break through and have this hit that's that's pretty amazing to me so i had to i had to note that he got that knowledge from his time in this movement understanding the importance of spectacle because you can argue that lightning doesn't necessarily strike twice for him he had some success with bow wow wow right um i want candy mm -hmm. um and i think i can't remember that some of the other bands that, that he dealt with that you know had some success but when it comes to iconic success does it ever top what he does with the Sex Pistols, even though that band burns out oh so fast, they do one half-ass tour in the states. <sighs> Done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And drugs play a part in that, but everybody's doing drugs. Mm -hmm. I can't. Why I can't. do you think? Why do you think the Sex Pistols burned out so fast? That's what they were supposed to do. Okay. That's that is that is what they were designed to do. They were designed to be chaos. And I don't think McLaren saw beyond the chaos mm -hmm. because there's also a certain level of financial success you're getting. So even if you have a statement you're trying to make, mm -hmm. the statement gets a little clouded with dollars. So mm -hmm. as they're selling records, the tour wasn't even all that successful in the States, mm -hmm. but if they were to go on and tour more and maybe even replace Sid Vicious with someone that isn't so <sighs> stereotypical of the chaos that McLaren wanted to see, <laughs> me just keep the regular bass player. I think that band persists, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. But well, okay, so I have something I, I want to bring up. This is I, this is the, a little anecdote I want to use to frame the rest of our conversation and tell me if this works for you. But um. When I was in high school, I tried to write one of my first short stories, a uh, science fiction story, and it was about a disc jockey. It's a very naive story, okay? It's not a good story. It was a piece of shit story, but it was my first attempt uh, to write seriously, I think, or one of my first attempts. And 
It's about a disc jockey living in some sort of totalitarian state. And what he did <clears throat> to fight against the powers of the establishment was play old rock and roll music from like the 50s and 60s. And like, you know, I don't remember the, the bands I chose at the time, but I'm going to assume it was something as banal and, and uh, inoffensive as like Paul Simon records. <laughs> <laughs> but I was going to bring down the establishment, right? And um, But I think that that sentiment about what rock music, what popular music and rock music could do or was about, that I, I kind of just picked up and put down at the age of 14 in a shitty short story. I think that was actually there in, in the musicians heads and the, uh, especially in punk musicians heads, but it was, there was a sense like punk was returning to rock uh, uh, somehow or returning to what was subversive about rock or a way that rock and roll was supposed to uh, change rebellion. society. Yeah. yeah. Do, so do you, do you, was that what, be a jumping off point for how to think about what it meant to you to be part of the hardcore and, and, and punk rock scene was that it was about uh, some sort of subversion of the society that you're in and it's, that, it's like really to, revolutionary. It's supposed to be counterculture, right? It's supposed to be a counterculture to the, to pop music. And um, the last tour I was on, and, and I will never say who the headliner was. Mm -hmm. um, they were a very, what we would, would, me and you would call a woke band. But they had so powerful imagery in their merchandise. They did instrumental music. So, I mean, they, they didn't have any real rhetoric other than kind of a woke, I shouldn't say kind of, it was very, very <laughs> woke rhetoric, land acknowledgements to start the show and shit like that. Mm -hmm. Um I had first saw them play. They were opening for uh, a friend of mine's band that's relatively large in our scene. Mm -hmm. um, and I went to him and I was like, "This these cats are kind of out there with this merch and some of the shit they're saying, considering they're playing in front of none but white people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he was like, yeah, man, but I think my, my fan base is pretty okay with it. But this is, yeah, this is, I think this is cool shit and I'm trying to help them. So... I became friends with these people and, and they took us on tour and I, I thought that they were really in line with what I wanted to do with, with bitter Lake and mm -hmm. kind of sadly, I was shocked that they were not because it was so woke and there's only so far woke shit really gets you. It's just another marketing tool. Mm -hmm. um, it's not about any sort of, rebellion or even really a counterculture in my opinion mm -hmm. um, you could you could have them open up a robin d'angelo speaking engagement and everyone would love it yeah but 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 oh but that the idea of like the counterculture is um a tricky one because i think like in the in the 60s there was this idea that a counterculture was going to emerge that would challenge and overtake mm -hmm. and overturn the mainstream culture that that the counterculture wasn't just an alternative culture within the dominant mainstream it wasn't just another marketing niche you know but it was like a revolutionary kind of force even if it wasn't overtly political all the time i mean or or like political in the sense of like seeking state power mm -hmm. but you know the idea of movement building and protest and counterculture all that went together and um and that's what punk was about but it i would disagree it, you don't think so no you don't think it was about okay it wasn't a countercultural movement maybe they thought it was okay what would you say a very individualist movement mm -hmm. i think the 60s protest music mm -hmm. And again, I don't think that music is going to lead you to overthrow capitalism. I'm not right. silly enough to believe that. But I do understand that there's music that has a collective message. Um, when James Brown sings, I'm black and I'm proud, he's not singing that um, as his own statement. That, that is for black America at large. Mm -hmm. And James Brown is a flawed individual, but he, he definitely 
collectively wanted to do what he could. You don't have to say James Brown was a flawed individual. That man <laughs> was the best. What are you talking about? <laughs> James <laughs> was a was a was a hustler and a like most of those guys from that era, right? Like most of those guys from that era that people don't like to acknowledge, they're hustlers and they're fucking thieves and they're pimps. Like they're not the greatest individuals, but they were part of movements one way or the other. Generally, you're talking about a time where we're trying to get civil rights. So a lot of these artists, even the bigger ones are outside of Motown, are talking about civil rights issues in the late 60s. Mm -hmm. You have the hippie movement that, that wants not just civil rights, but they want women's liberation and they want to stop this unjust war in Vietnam. And people are thinking a little more collectively. And punk to me comes a lot more out of the beginnings of neoliberalism, especially hardcore. It's literally born as Reagan and Thatcher come into power. And that's why I do note that in the piece. That in is, the early days of my diet of the diet soap podcast, I interviewed a guy named Jefferson Cowie mm -hmm. <clears throat> who had written a book about the seventies. I forgot. I forgot what the, what the, uh, it's called staying alive. Okay. It's the name of the book. About disco? Yeah. It's about disco, and but it's also about the labor movement. Oh, dope. Yeah. And it was, uh, and, and it was like saying the thing about uh, disco was that it was an individualistic uh, 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 movement and hedonistic, but he was specifically talking about like Saturday Night Fever, the kind mm. of the, the movie with John Travolta is like the, the, the story. Of Saturday Night Fever it was a story of how individual talent was your ticket out of the destruction of the late 70s. And you look at like the Bee Gees staying alive uh, uh, music video, right? And they're walking through ruins. Um, they're walking through a, a ghost town. Old left yeah. behind, yeah, left behind by the deindustrialization, right? I think that it looks like it. Maybe it was a bombed out area, but I, but they it definitely they're in the ruins of society. I'm talking about staying alive and and dancing, and um, so for Jefferson Cowie's perspective, disco was the individualistic, aspirational mm -hmm. uh, music, and he says, and it was aspirational for you know uh, a, a, to a large extent, it was uh, aspirational for people of color and for gay people, right? It was a, a but both of the, the that's what he said. So I just believed him. Maybe I'm wrong there. But then he said, like punk, I don't know. I actually don't remember if he said anything about punk. But what I would say is punk was like a negation of disco. It wasn't more collective. It was just like individual nihilism, individual yes. destruction. It, yeah. Yes. Yes. So, and and when and we we say punk, like, are you talking? That New York era of the late yeah, 70s. Yeah, I'm thinking like so, the Sex Pistols, I, Crass. Okay, so that's uh, Britain. So you're talking New York or Britain. I think there's they're very different. Uh, okay, the X-ray specs. Um, does that th those are all Brit British, aren't they? The, the yeah. So so I think I think the British scene is is a little different because the British scene is to me a lot more diverse in sonic quality. Right. Um. Is it. it the American scene is a lot more diverse in sonic quality. The people that get lumped in with what is punk. Oh yeah. The American scene is. Yeah. Well, right. I mean, the, the American scene produces like new wave and like, and no way like when you get like the sonic youth out of that. And people right. like Lydia lunch come out of that, that same, that same scene that no, the quote unquote, no wave scene that around the same time as, as the, the punk guys are starting to blow up. Cause remember Blondie, is a quote unquote punk punk band in the seventies that goes on to have a disco hit and right. become kind of iconic eighties band forever. They will always be an iconic eighties band, but the people that came up in that scene, when you think about uh, the talking heads, I was going to say the talking heads, band, heads came out of, you know, I mean, I still love they're, they're, the they're first and foremost, they're kind of known as a, as a punk, a punk band from that CBGB's Max's Kansas City yeah, scene but, in New York. Yeah, but the CBGB scene was more like, I don't know, art school 
uh, avant-garde. Is it? Art music. It seemed to me like, wasn't it? The Ramones played there too. Did they go to art school? No, I guess not. But the Talking Heads sure as fuck seemed like they did. But a lot of those, yes. A lot of those guys, it's a, yes. A lot of those the guys did go to art school. Uh, there is, there is a certain bourgeois element to a lot of the stuff they're well, doing. I, I, I'm, you know, I'm not trying to characterize their class position, to, you know, although that might be that true, but like, oh yeah, there's they, 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 but the, there's less nihilism in a Talking Heads song, or in anything that went from punk to the new wave, you know, through however route they got but, there. Like Elvis again, Costello think, is another one. That's I, I, the British when we, side. When yeah. we think of punk again, I think it's the British reiteration, like rock, like rock music for a lot of people. If I say rock music, not everybody's thinking fuck Little Richard and Chuck Berry. A lot of people, especially when I say classic rock, do you think Little Richard and Chuck Berry? Are you thinking Led Zeppelin? No, I think of Rolling Stones, Led Zeppelin. Right? Yeah, so you're thinking yeah. of the British interpretation of black blues. Right. But if you of, say rock and black. roll, then I think of Chuck Berry and, and Little Richard and Buddy Holly and, you know, the big, big bopper. And, big bopper and maybe even Richie Valens, depending on, yeah, on right. how, down, how far down you want to go. But when you talk to old schoolers, yeah. If you were to talk to a guy like Lemmy from Motorhead, mm -hmm. that's his bag is that first wave of American rock and roll because for him, that was the first dangerous music he was ever around. Right. And it is <clears throat> amazing that, I mean, I think that, that I love that. I love Buddy Holly. You know, I love the old, uh, old, and I love Little Richard and love James Brown and Chuck Berry. <laughs> Although I've heard things about Chuck oh. Berry. Uh, <laughs> oh. at least look I, living in a living in a in a room in a, in a place full of old music guys that have done crazy drugs and crazy shit i'm always surprised at how blown away everyone gets to chuck berry stories <laughs> yeah, yeah. like that that's when i'm not gonna say what they are but uh, I know uh, someone who works in the mental health field who told me it's Chuck Berry stories, and uh, <laughs> they're and they're they're and, so and insane. I was like, oh no, 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 don't tell me about that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's uh, look if you want tame Chuck Berry stories, anyone that's listening or watching this, if you want a tame Chuck Berry story, uh, Keith mm -hmm. Richards has a documentary on Netflix where he's hired. Chuck Berry to play some shows or, or maybe Chuck at somehow they're playing shows together and Keith Richards is very, you know, he loves Chuck Berry. Chuck right. Berry is the it for him. Yeah. Yeah. And, but he hates dealing with Chuck Berry. Well, Chuck and Berry Bruce didn't Springsteen like him. comes in there and starts talking about dealing with Chuck Berry. And it's, it's interesting, but it's definitely not the stories Doug and I are talking about, but no. it, <laughs> it, it'll kind of give you an idea of of Chuck, and that's also one of the things I I wanted. I I, I, didn't I, I heard Chuck Berry talk about Keith Richards once on a documentary, and Chuck and Berry it's said, hilarious. He said, "Well, they kept wanting me to play and sound different than I play and sound because when they were listening to my records, they were listening to them at the wrong speed." <laughs> <laughs> like I'm not a chipmunk. What, what what do you want me to play like that for? <laughs> like Chuck, when we think of gut I iconic guitar players, I was talking about this with somebody on somebody's show. I was like, when you think of iconic guitar players, you never say Chuck Berry's name. And I think the reason why is because he lived. Hmm. Had Chuck Berry died at 27, like the 27 club, whatever you want to call it, hmm. then I think he's looked at as a guitar hero, as maybe the first guitar hero. Yeah. And, you know, when you're learning guitar and you're learning your favorite rock band, maybe ACDC, maybe even Van Halen to a certain degree, the first thing people are going to tell you is we learn Chuck Berry solos because these are just sped up Chuck Berry solos, especially ACDC and Angus Young. Mm -hmm. I'm like, man, you're telling me that this guy's effect on the music scene is inspiring kind of the first wave of what we call heavy metal, like, 20 plus years later mm -hmm. that's in which is inspiring music even today because there's people that are wouldn't want to be like angus and yeah. it's like oh that's that's interesting we don't really talk about that enough and it all turns out that the real man with behind it all was marty mcfly the time <laughs> <laughs> a 
white guy the whole fucking yeah. time. <laughs> yeah, who knew? Oh, remember who that knew? sound? You were looking for <laughs> Watch Back to the Future. <laughs> I cracked the fuck up, man. Yeah. I cracked the fuck <laughs> up. I went, yeah. Did I go to the theater? I think I went to the theater to see that Michael J. Fox movie with Joan Jett. Yeah. Light of Day. Mm. Yeah, Came yeah. 87. Mm-hmm. I had no business watching that movie as like 10 years old, but do you remember that movie? <laughs> I, I, you know, I do. I like, I remember Bright Lights, Big City. Ooh, I think, it's a good movie. Yeah, I like that one. But the, you know, the thing about, I want to say, like, people get mad at that scene uh, in Back to the Future saying that it was about cultural appropriation. But if you are a sci fi nerd, <laughs> the, there's, a, there's a paradox there. Cause the only reason he can play Johnny Be Good is because he heard the Chuck Berry record. Yeah. So it's a bootstrap problem, which came first. It's like, it's not, um, but, uh, but nonetheless, um, uh, it's a very silly comment, but the, no, I, I, I want to, I like your, I, I feel like I'm not doing you justice here. Cause your, your essay was really good. And like, I, and, and it was not um, like, we're skimming the surface. So we're talking like fans, but it was, you were making um, some political points, but the, the, question i have is that there's an assumption here about the way that the popular culture reflects and responds to the political crises and economic crises in society that you're writing about and and um i i so like i want to go back and and talk about chuck berry and, and little richard and and early rock and roll mm-hmm. and like note that it was coming up after um the major uh, great depression yeah uh uh you know nuclear bombings yeah uh, uh holocaust um and it was part of in, in from the beginning of a sense that the youth were lost that the you know there was a sense that, that like the invention of the concept of the teenager and the concept of the deep generational divisions that we think of as sort of they're almost a parody of themselves now with the, you know, okay, boomer stuff and all that. And that I get called, I get called a boomer now. I'm really tired of it. But, but uh, the, the point is like that all started right around then. And rock and roll was an expression, even though it didn't, it had a political side to it, but it wasn't like the sex pistols uh, saying, God save the queen. It wasn't like, uh, you know, um, Chumbawamba or, you know, it wasn't, <laughs> protest mu- music <laughs> it, it, well the, the, you're talking about the first wave right well, yeah well, i'm talking rock and roll like it, you was, know, it, was, Little Richard, it, it was frightening music because it comes from it, it's music that comes from the bottom right it's music mm-hmm. that comes from the hoods of of, of the time mm-hmm. so the mississippi delta um hell who is the native american guy that has the most iconic riff of all time i can't think of his name blong, blong, blong. What do you what do you think the first rock and roll song was? What's, I think what's it's that? And I can't think gonna, of it. I'm gonna Google it. Name. First rock and roll. It's that it's that native cat. It's He's a too native soon cat. to know by Deborah Chesler. It's nineteen forty eight is what the Oh, the I, I wouldn't tells know me. that song. But you know, I, I don't go back that far. I'm more like <laughs> and I'm not a music historian by no stretch of the imagination, but I'm more of um that first wave of like was it Sun Records? Yeah, yeah. Um, That's so what El- Elvis was on Sun Records, wasn't he? Elvis was on Sun Records, and it, you yeah. know, you know, Elvis was like, I like Negro music, and I yeah. live in this Negro part of town, and my dad does Negro shit, and he's in jail, and you know, uh, I, I dig this shit. And Sun Records uh, owner was like, you know, I dig colored records too, and we're gonna have you do. Uh, these colored records and the industry was a very different time. And I don't think people understand that uh, when we think back to the fifties and sixties, even Motown, it was a, it was a very factory driven um, um, industry. So you churn out songs. If Doug sings it and it doesn't hit, then Jason's going to sing it. If Jason sings it and it doesn't hit, then Pascal sings it and so forth and so on until it hits. And, that's probably not the way people want to remember that era. They probably mm-hmm. want to remember it as, you know, one person sang a song and a, and a whole movement started of, of 
of white people that wanted to scare their parents by shaking their hips to colored people singing about fucking. Um, <laughs> I don't know if it's that direct of a line. Yeah, yeah, I know, but yeah. Um, but there were actually a, a lot of, it, there was people covering all the same songs over and over again. Oh, yeah. yeah. And Blue Sway yeah, Shoes. Yeah. Is the cover. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. That's not an Elvis Presley song. No. Um, um, but that and, was going on in folk music, too. Like uh, Peter's, Pete Seeger made it Laurel, Laura Mulvey, or I forget, but the, you know, the little, How, little Boxes song. Mm-hmm. That's not a Pete. It's everyone knows the Pete Seeger version, but it was somebody else who wrote it. But he made well, that famous. famous African song uh, that's in the junk, the lion, the Lion King. He he doesn't. He didn't write. He found. He heard, mm-hmm. and thought. It's actually kind of sad. He thought that his label was going to pay the actual guys that wrote it. He was like, "Hey, find these are the people. You go find them, and you you pay them." You make sure they get their royalty cut from this, right? And you know and they're, they're like, and they're like, oh yeah, sure, you bet, we'll do that. In principle, I agree with you, hundred <laughs> percent. <laughs> but of course, they're going to have to protect the company. Um, <laughs> There's a good documentary on that. Um, I think it's called "When the Lion Sleeps at Night," and it's it's about um, one man's journey, um, who's descended from I think the first. British ruler of South Africa. British? British ruler. Uh, well, right. Or, yeah. I can't remember. And 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 he and him trying to make right by getting the family of the man that was one of the original singers um their money from that song, their their royalties. And it was years to track them down, to figure out who got paid what. It's, it's an interesting story that kind of shows people how the the business worked back then it's a very 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 different business in 2021 than it was you know, mm-hmm. yeah and it was more and like you say there's like a central a few central places where the music was being written yeah. and then you had musicians come in and, and it would pump out the the songs and it's, see it's, what it would take that's what country music is today actually country music today mm-hmm. there's still nashville that's where motherfuckers want to go to nashville because there's work in nashville Mm-hmm. Either you're going to be one of the actors on stage that are pretty boys that hold the instruments, mm-hmm. or you're going to be one of the motherfuckers that shit out songs all day. Right, right. And make but, a good living. But why do you think it is that we went from that, 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 uh, I guess it's black, uh, be, you know, music from below became, mm-hmm. uh, relatively ma- like dominated American culture. Not relatively mainstream, but like dominated youth culture, just took it over um, in the fifties. And and uh, do you think that is uh, somehow a response to the combination of the Great Depression and the World War and uh, the the cons- the advent of consumer society at the same time? Can we say rock and roll was born of both of those things? <sighs> Yeah, because how do you market rebellion? Mm -hmm. And the best way to market rebellion might be to soften it a bit and put a white face on it. Mm -hmm. There's a great movie by Robert Townsend called The Five Heartbeats, Mm -hmm. where there's a scene where, and I know you haven't seen it because there's black people in it. And uh, (laughs) I watch movies with black people in it. Like I've seen all the Star Trek movies. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> there's a scene there's a scene in the five heartbeats where they're trying to change the cover of the record mm. and apparently that scene was taken from a real life story that robert townsend had heard when he was researching writing the movie mm. where a, a group and i can't remember which group it was the cover of the record which was them was replaced by it was either white people or like a white couple kissing. Mm-hmm. And it was a, it was kind of a constant thing that was happening in that, that genre that, you know, we can't, we can't um, sell this to middle America with these black faces. Now, fast forward 30, 40 years later, the first wave of MTV. So we're talking 81, 82 here. Mm-hmm. 
I know that's when it was actually it was I feel like in a way the the uh, I don't know rock and roll was more honest and and less repressive than MTV was because so MTV remember, would David not Bowie's, put black music up on on they would air. not and David Bowie who was married to the first black supermodel mm-hmm. ass on MTV why don't you play black people why don't you play any black artists and the response was pretty funny to me because it came right away and the guy goes I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but I do remember MTV. If you remember this, Doug. He asked him on the air. Hmm? He asked him while he was on the air. It was like, yeah. But, yeah. yeah. Was, Why don't you guys play? They were, they were interviewing David Bowie. I can't remember what, but maybe it was Let's Dance that came out. Mm-hmm. And um, and and the Mark something is the, that guy's name. And they used to have radio DJs that were MTV hosts. So these guys were probably a little more adept at being quick on their toes. Mm-hmm. And the guy goes, well, you know, the station just feels that black faces would probably scare people and i'm paraphrasing scare people in the middle of the country and bowie sits back and he goes thank you <laughs> <laughs> and 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 i and i love and i love i love that exchange because as certain artists like rick james fought real hard to get on mtv mm-hmm and kind of led a campaign to his detriment. Why won't you play me? Why are you playing punk ass Prince? Prince don't sell records like me. I'm the motherfucking king of these streets. I'm mm-hmm. the king of these black ass streets. You ain't playing me. No, we ain't playing you because you're saying shit like that. That's why we play Prince. Fuck you. I, I don't know. I think Prince was, I, I don't know. I like Rick James. I like Prince. Prince seems to me like a he was bigger talent. He was made for MTV. Prince was yeah. made for MTV. They both had multiracial bands. Mm-hmm. They both did the punk funk. I'm a little safer than the Parliament Funkadelic type music because regardless of whatever they were doing off stage, they're a little more easier to consume. Even Rick James, as much as he thinks he's the, the king of the hood, he's still a little easier to consume and follow than the wild crazy party that is parliament funkadelic and every other band that Clinton is, is doing during, during that era. Um, and Prince is even, and I, and I'm saying this as a huge Prince fan is, is even easier to swallow in my opinion than Rick James, because he has more pop sensibilities. Um, you know, I, I, I have two major memories about Prince when he was, coming up <clears throat> first one was it was one of the his song raspberry beret was like one of the first songs that actually made me at the age of like 14 feel horny <laughs> like <listen> that <laughs> it's like holy shit something's happening to me um <laughs> um and uh, <laughs> oh my body's changing. <laughs> so, <laughs> that was the first thing about it. And, and oh no, now I can't remember the second thing about Prince. Uh, oh, well, that's all I remember. But oh, no, the second thing was the only time in my life I won a radio contest. It was the 100th <laughs> caller. And I won Around the World in a Day by Prince. And great record. About, yeah, it's a great record. So I think it's, it's, well, it's my favorite Prince album because it's the first one I ever got. But um, it's a it's a good record, and Prince was awesome, and uh, yeah, and he was Comedy. he was more he was certainly a lot da- more dangerous than like Michael Jackson or yes. Hall and Oates. Yes, <laughs> you know, well, other yes. you know, Duran Duran, Duran yes. Duran. Mm-hmm. But there's also something that's just non controversial about Little Red Corvette. Yeah. I- Yes, but I mean, I, mean, I don't know have the imagery that Rick James has. When you think about Rick James as the street songs, I think is is his big record with a lot of the, the hits that people know where he's wearing the, the black leather boots, the, the, the thigh high boots and the, the, the black jack. He's wearing an outfit that only fucking Rick James can wear. Right. Well, I mean, that's the thing about the thing about Rick James to me was that, yeah, he, he might have been raunchy, mm-hmm. but he wasn't dangerous enough to be like sexy, to, like make you make you actually like long for it or something. Linda Blair may tell you a different story. 
Okay, all right. <laughs> you know, <that's> right. <laughs> like and and like by the way, it's like you know when I I want to point out like it wasn't horny for Prince, although maybe, but I, it was it was <laughs> like he told the he told the story yeah. of this of picking this woman up and taking Darla her Nikki. If you if look, Darla Nikki is probably one of the sexiest songs I'll ever hear in my lifetime. You can be as sexy right. as that song. But you're not going to be sexier than that song. Mm -hmm. um, and then the way he performs it in the movie Purple Rain is also like it made me uncomfortable. I was like six or seven when I went to go watch it. My parents, my dad mm -hmm. took me to the theater because I was such a big Prince fan. And I remember being uncomfortable watching it. I'm 44 right now. If I turn on Purple Rain, which is actually a movie I love, and watch that, I'll still feel uncomfortable watching it perform. <laughs> <laughs> darling nikki mm. <laughs> he's got the hand like you know like it's, he he was on another level i think when it came to to sex appeal and his, him being so comfortable um um being being a sex symbol and, I, and and rick james did the same thing rick james to me was just a little more quote-unquote hood with it mm. um I'm not saying that's why MTV didn't play him. I think age is a bit of a factor with with uh, MTV at this time too. They're trying to find uh, young talent. Prince was a lot younger than Rick James at the time, and uh, yeah, that's good. Let's go back to punk for a second because it just dawned on me that the difference between the music that the punks were putting out, whether it was in the United States or in the UK. And mm -hmm. the music that they were overturning mm -hmm. had uh, something to do with sex. Like you might get laid at a punk concert, but it was that was like a you know because you were the right age and the right scene, but you weren't. <laughs> but but it wasn't like uh, you were going to the, the the music wasn't about sex. No. The music didn't, no. wasn't designed to to make you think about sex. The music was about violence and rejection and uh, of society. The music was, I mean, I don't know about a lot of different things, but it was mostly about alienation. Um, or or if it was a, a CBGB's like you know scene, um, you know if it's not if not the Ramones and, and but like the Talking Heads, which it's weird to think of them as punk, really. It right? was about yeah <laughs> yeah but it was about uh, uh uh enjoying your alienation getting off on being uh uh disconnected you know who else i i i, I kind of relate to talking heads to is um Lori anderson do you know Lori can you say anderson? that again my, my computer Look, cut out can you say that again yeah Lori anderson do you know Lori anderson's music no mm -hmm. uh oh okay well she is fading for sure then she had a hit called oh superman she was married to um, Lou Reed. Ah, uh, uh, I know who you're talking about now. I know who you're talking about now. Yeah, she was like a oh, yeah. part of that New York avant-garde. Yeah, uh, New York avant-garde scene. She had a bunch of albums, uh, but she only had one hit, and it was Oh Superman in like 1980 something. But know, <clears> anyway, and 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 like um, Brian Eno, you know Brian Eno, Talking Heads, um, uh, Philip Glass. Uh, Laurie Anderson. I didn't realize Philip Glass did the soundtrack for Candyman. Did did he? Yeah, yeah. yeah the whole movie. I didn't realize that. Yeah, he did a um, lot of soundtracks. But anyway, but um, but think about that scene. Now think about that scene. And and the reason why I positioned my piece not in the New York no wave and and punk scene of the seventies that gives birth to the Sex Pistols. Mm -hmm. I positioned it more in the eighties because I feel like that's. That response to me was the direct response to the conservatism of, of the eight of, of Reagan. Of Reagan and Thatcher and towards yeah. the end with, with Carter, right? It, it's it's totally young people starting to realize that they're not gonna have the same future that their dads had. Yeah, but it's interesting though, right? That the in the 60s and 70s, the rebellion was connected to sex. Yeah. It was connected to uh, breaking the old family values and morality of the 50s and early 60s, like right? going off and living your life for yourself and also like 
just having new social norms around uh, around sexuality, the, you know, the freaking sexual revolution in the eighties. The the it, the rebellion was against like not not it wasn't about having sex. It was about I don't know decadence and 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 alienation and being blank. You know being vacant it's also the first generation we are the first generation you and i even though you're a few years older than me we're the first generation that's being constantly sold to more so than our parents and we have brand recognition and we right i guess so because we're the we're the tv babies right we are the tv babies and so my cultural touchstones are commercials right yeah G.I. Joe, He-Man, all those are 22-minute commercials aimed at me consuming products with these, with these images on it. That's all it's designed to do. It's designed to manipulate me. It was designed to get around a law that said they couldn't do it. Right. And even though we make fun of the PSAs that are at the end of these 22-minute these commercials, mm. We still remember those PSAs. <laughs> They're still a part of us. Mm -hmm. And where it got interesting to me was I was given this, this, uh, this academic essay by this guy that was just from the punk scene. And he talked about these two cultures, one of deconstruction and one of authenticity. Mm -hmm. And what was funny was before I read it, that was part of my conversation with all the people I was talking to when I was doing my interviews for this. I was actually doing interviews for this thing because I really wanted to see if I was on to something, if I was just like, like who, who did you interview? Like, like what kind of people? Uh, you know, for, first of all, I interviewed people in the scene. Um, like, like punk bands? bands? People in punk bands? bands? Um, and... With would I'd constantly spitball the 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 thesis is off to Ray Reed, who's mm -hmm. a good friend, and and he would connect me with people like, oh, I think you're talking to this guy, and uh, Conan Neutron, uh, who's a good friend of mine. Hopefully, you get him on your show at some point in time. What is his deal? He's always wearing a sequin jacket. That's what is that? Thing, Does that that's that's he, he, that's that's he does that? Yeah. Okay. Conan is a good friend. No, um, I know he seems like a cool guy, but he's kind of, I feel like he's, there's a little bit of Las Vegas to Conan. Neutron. He's, he's a, he's a silly, he's silly. That shit is the only silly aspect of him. Everything else about him is very, very serious. I've actually played in his band and we, we've toured together and, mm -hmm. and Conan is, is a very, very serious music critic. And this conversation, if he was here would be very, very different because he definitely would go down certain rabbit holes with you journalistically that I won't go down because that's mm -hmm. not necessarily my bag. Mm -hmm. Um, my whole you, thing, Jason, was, you know me well enough to know that I'm, I pretend to be a serious person on YouTube, but I'm actually probably one of the silliest people you've ever met. If people were privy to our like off camera <laughs> conversations when we're messaging each other back and forth, they'd be like, You guys are kind of fucking raunchy old men. We're like, yeah. <laughs> right. I'm totally fine with that. Like, I'm glad, I'm glad you, you, I was going to tell you a story that I know you want to hear from me about being down here, and I'll leave it at that. Okay, well, I'll, uh, we can do that in the parrot room. Okay. You want to tell me this? I don't uh, want to anywhere on the internet. 